Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We now move on to the Kitab al-Hajj. Al-Hajj in the language meaning to intend something. Technically it means an act of devotion to Allah Jalla wa'ala in which you intend to make a journey to the Kaaba to perform specific rites. It was made obligatory in the ninth year of the Hijri calendar because before that Makkah was under the jurisdiction of the Mushrikeen. So after the conquest of Makkah in the eighth year, Makkah became a Muslim city and Hajj became obligatory in the ninth year. Abu Bakr and some companions went to perform Hajj at that time. The Prophet could not make it because he had to receive the different delegations from around the land coming to embrace Islam. So he made the Hajj in the 10th year. It is obligatory to be performed once in a lifetime at the minimum for the one who is able to make a way there because Hajj is an act of Ibadah in which you would have to put up with more difficulty than any other act of Ibadah. It is not obligatory on the servant, on the insane and on the child. And we have a hadith authentically which says that any child who performs a hajj then upon him is another hajj and any servant who performs a hajj and he is then free then upon him is another hajj to be performed. So from this hadith then some ulama take that if a servant was to perform the hajj he has to perform another hajj, the obligatory hajj, if he becomes free. Some other scholars said that if a servant performs a hajj then this would suffice. So if he was to become free then he would not need to perform another hajj because it would suffice. But the hadith clearly mentions to us that upon him would be another hajj. If we take this hadith to be authentic, This hadith, as Shaykh al-Albani has graded it to be authentic. So if we say it is authentic, then it is clear cut. Any servant who performs a hajj during his time as a servant, then he is freed then upon him is to perform another hajj. So upon this opinion then, the servitude of the servant would be an attribute which prevents his hajj from being correct. So in the same way, the child, his childhood is an attribute of this person which prevents his hajj from being accepted as a wajib hajj. Of course, it's accepted as a nafila, no doubt. It's the same thing with a mad person. If he performs a hajj, it would be accepted as a nafila, but upon him is to perform another hajj when or if he gains his senses or intellect. If a person cannot perform hajj due to him being weak, then he must perform the hajj when he regains his health. If it is not expected that he will regain his health, then he must pay someone to perform the hajj on his behalf, and that would be obligatory upon him. Let's take this first hadith from Ibn Umar. He says that a man asked the Prophet what does a muhrim wear in the state of ihram? The muhrim being the one who has made his intention to enter the rituals of the hajj. Now there are certain things which are haram for him and from the things haram for him to do are to wear certain types of clothing which would ordinarily be halal. And so the Prophet answered by saying لا تلبس القمص ولا العمائم ولا السراويلاتي ولا البرانسة ولا الخفاف إلا أحد لا يجد النعلين فليلبس الخفين وليقضعهما أسفل من الكعبين ولا تلبس من الثياب شيئا مسه الزعفران ولا الورس Do not wear any shirts, nor turbans, nor trousers, nor hooded cloaks, nor the خفين, the leather socks Except if someone does not find sandals or shoes, then he can wear the khuffain, but he cuts them from below the ankle. And do not wear any clothing which has za'faran or waras on it. Notice here that this question which was asked to the Prophet in the city of al Madina, was asking about what a muhrim wears. And the Prophet replied by answering what a muhrim does not wear. So why is that? Well, there's great wisdom behind this. If you know what the muhrim does not wear, then anything besides this is permissible to be worn. And so answering in this way is permissible if it would make the answer more sensible because what you're not allowed to wear is limited. If you can just remove that which is limited, then everything else is permissible. It takes the opposite ruling. And so going that way around would make more sense, which is why the Prophet chose that way around. Notice what he says about the khuffain, that you cut them below the ankle so that it resembles the na'alain. Na'alain being shoes or sandals or anything which would cover your foot. 
So any type of shoes, trainers, sandals which would cover your foot is okay and it classifies as a na'al. Notice that this ruling is abrogated because on Arafah when he was addressing the people he told them that whoever does not wear the na'alain then let him wear the khufain and he did not mention cutting it below the ankles. And many people at Arafah were listening to that hadith for the first time. So it implies that the ruling to cut the khufain below the ankles is abrogated and this would be the stronger opinion. We can make qiyas on these items of clothing. So we can say that these items of clothing which are made haram in the hadith are obviously haram for the muhrim and that which is similar to it is also likewise haram. So with the qameez we could look at something like a jumper or a coat or a jacket. With the ama'im, with the turban, we can look at the shimagh which is something you often find the Saudi people wearing and also the skull cap. Even if you were to put a handkerchief on your head that would not be allowed because the Prophet forbade the hooded cloak so you're not allowed to wear any headgear. Of course you're allowed to cover your head with an umbrella let's say or if you're carrying luggage on your head as some people may do this is permissible because this is not counted as headwear. As for the sarawilat then we could make the analogy with shorts and pants. As for the khufain not allowed to be worn then we can make the analogy with the jawarib which are the normal conventional socks which you wear. Notice that a lot of people say you're not allowed to wear stitched clothing or that which is stitched and designed to be worn around the body and that is simply incorrect. The Prophet never spoke about stitched clothing and it does not work because you're allowed to wear shoes and shoes are stitched. Likewise with trainers, they're from the Na'al, they are stitched and you're allowed to wear that. You're allowed to wear a watch, that is stitched. Some people may manufacture underwear which is not stitched. And this is going by the ruling that you're not allowed to wear stitched clothing. And this is incorrect. You're not even allowed to wear that underwear which is not stitched. Because the ruling does not revolve around that which is stitched or not. It revolves around the items of clothing given in the hadith and that which is similar to it. We learn also that you're not allowed to wear any clothing which has perfume on it. And likewise, you're not allowed to wear any perfume during the state of ihram. You can put perfume on before you enter the state of ihram on your body or your clothing and you do not need to remove it after you enter ihram. That is fine because that's a continuation. What is haram is the initiation. You're not allowed to begin this perfume in the state of ihram. What about perfumed soap? Well, if the soap has a natural scent to it, then that's not putting perfume on. If it is perfumed, then that would be putting perfume on and so it should be avoided. Also in the chapter, the Prophet said, مَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ نَعْلَيْنْ فَلْيَلْبَسْ خُفَّيْنْ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ إِزَارًا فَلْيَلْبَسْ سَرَاوِيلْ Whoever does not find na'alain, then let him wear the khuffain. And whoever does not find an izar to wear, then let him wear sarawil, which are trousers. They are normally the thinner material trousers, which are worn underneath the qameez or the izar. Hadith number two about the mawaqit from Ibn Abbas. He said that the Prophet appointed for the Ahlul Madina Dhul Hulayfa as the miqat, meaning that point at which they must be entered into the state of ihram and they're not allowed to pass beyond that point without being in ihram. And for the Ahlul Sham it is al juhfa and for the Ahlul Najd it is Qarnul Manazil and for the Ahlul Yaman it is Yalamlam. He said Hunna lahunna وَلِمَنْ أَتَى عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَهْلِهِنَّ مِمَّنْ أَرَادَ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ فَمَنْ كَانَ دُونَهُنَّ فَمِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَكَذَا فَكَذَلِكَ حَتَّى أَهْلُ مَكَّةَ يُهِلُّونَ مِنْهَا He said that these mawaqeet are for people of those places as mentioned and for people of other than those places who pass by these mawaqeet for the ones who want to perform the hajj and the umrah as for anyone who lives within the bounds of these mawaqeet, then they will make their ihram from where they are. Even the people of Mecca will make the talbiyah as they start their ihram from wherever they are. The hajj has a miqat or if you like a boundary, makani, a place boundary and a zamani, a time boundary. The zamani are the months of the hajj. You cannot enter the state of ihram except in the months of the Hajj, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'dah and Dhul Hijjah. 
Umrah, however, does not have any miqat zamani. It could be performed at any time. However, both of them do have a miqat makani, a particular place beyond which you are not allowed to be outside the state of Ihram. All of these mawaqid are villages. So for the Ahlul Sham, like the people from Syria and that place, it is al Juhfa. For the people from the north of Najd, it is Qarnul Manazil. It's named after a mountain there, which is in the shape of a horn, which is a Qarn. We learn that these mawaqid are put in place by the Sharia as a ta'zim or an honoring to the Kaaba, that you must be in this sacred state even when you approach or come near to the Kaaba. However, we could be met with a situation. The people of Asham, their miqat, as we have found out, is al Juhfa. What if they come to the Kaaba, they actually might pass by Dhul Hulayfa first before al Juhfa. And this is very possible because the furthest miqat away from the Kaaba is Dhul Hulayfa. And Juhfa comes afterwards. It is closer to Mecca than Dhul Hulayfa. Now, the question here is, these people of Sham, must they be in the state of Ihram as they pass by Dhul Hulayfa? Or are they permitted to delay up till Juhfa? Some say it is permissible for them to delay. The majority of the scholars say that no, they're not allowed to delay because when they pass by the Miqat of Dhul Hulayfa, then they must be in the state of Ihram. Even though the first opinion is rational because the Prophet appointed Al Juhfa as their Miqat, so they ought to be allowed to delay. But we say that the majority opinion would be the safer one, so it is better that they are in a state of Ihram if they were to pass by Dhul Hulayfa. We learn from the hadith that you don't have to be in the state of Ihram as you pass by these places if you do not intend the Hajj or the Umrah. The people of Mecca would make their Ihram from wherever they are. If they want to perform the Umrah, they will have to go outside the Haram if they are already in the Haram. And the closest hill outside the Haram is Tan'im, which is where the Prophet sent Aisha as she wanted to perform the Umrah by itself. If a person is travelling to Mecca, not intending the Hajj or the Umrah, then after he passes by the Miqat, he has a change of mind and wants to perform the Hajj and the Umrah. Where should he enter the Ihram from? Well, we say he enters the Ihram from wherever he is, because his intention to perform the Hajj and the Umrah was only in effect after he passed the Miqat. If it was in effect before he passed the Miqat, then he must be in the state of Ihram before he passes the Miqat. So notice the subtle difference there. If someone is not going to be passing by any one of these Mawaqeet, then in that case you have to enter the state of Ihram in a place which is parallel to the nearest Miqat. If you join the dots, then the Mawaqeet form like an oval shape. So we can say that when you reach the perimeter of this oval, then you must be in a state of Ihram. We also know that the Prophet appointed that Urq as the Miqat of the people of Al-Iraq. And it's also reported that Umar appointed that Urq as the Miqat for the people of Al-Iraq. So this would appear to be one of those cases where the Ishtihad of Umar agrees with what the Prophet has taught. Making the Ihram before the Miqat is Makru, though it would still be valid. However, entering the Ihram before the Miqat Zamani, before the time limit, which is the month of the Hajj, of course, that would render your Ihram invalid. It would be much like starting your Salah before the time has begun. It would be invalid. Hadith number three about the Talbiyah. From Ibn Umar, he says that my father informed me that he heard the Prophet making the Talbiyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. I'm answering your call, O oh Allah, I'm answering your call, time after time. Labbayka la sharika laka labbayk. I'm answering your call time after time, there is no partner with you. Labbayk, I'm answering your call. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. Verily, the praise and the bounty all belong to you, and also the dominion belongs to you, you have no partner. So the word talbiya means to respond to a call. Labbayk has this idea of responding twice, but that's not what is intended. What is intended is that I'm responding to your call time after time. Often in Arabic, the dual format could actually refer to repeated format, as in the statement of Allah, 
ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب اليك البصر خاسئا وهو حصير and then look again and again and again time after time your sight will return to you in a state of humiliation and worn out so even though the dual format is used karrataini twice so you repeat it twice but what is intended is time after time so look to the heavens time after time do you see any rifts in the heavens the people of jahiliya will also make talbiya but they would include some shirk in that the mushrikun would say illa sharikan huwa lak tamlikuhu wa ma malak except your partner you own him and he does not own anything and they would say this whilst they were making the tawaf around the house we also know that ibn umar added to this talbiya he would say labbayk labbayk wa sa'dayk wal khayru fi yadayk labbayk wal raghba ilayk wal amal so labbayk labbayk and continuously at your service and all goodness is in your hands and all desire and hope is directed to you and also the actions are directed to you one can say this if one wishes however it is better to restrict yourself to the sunnah when did the prophet first say the talbiya well different reports are given and every companion reported what they knew so some said that he made talbiya when he rose on the riding animal some said that when he rode on to a high piece of land al bayda that's when he made the talbiya and some said that immediately when he entered the state of ihram he made the talbiya three reports and so it's a flexible issue every person is reporting what they saw but the point is that the more talbiya you make the better and particularly when you're riding an animal or perhaps a car you're riding from one place to the other you make talbiya the more the merrier you stop making the talbiya when you stone the jamrat al aqba on the 10th because that signifies the beginning of the end of the ihram hadith number 4 the prophet ordering the people of al madina to enter the ihram at the masjid of dhul hulaifa from salim from abdullah who heard his father say who is of course umar radhiyallahu an he said your bayda is this where you people lie against the prophet the prophet did not make the ihlal meaning the talbiya for the ihram except from the masjid of dhul hulaifa what umar is saying here is that you people claim that the prophet made the ihram at bayda now bayda is past dhul hulaifa so bayda is a place which is not the same as dhul hulaifa umar is saying here that the prophet made the ihram or entered the ihram at the masjid of dhul hulaifa not bayda and so this is why he says you would lie against the prophet this is not the evil type of lie rather what it means is that you say something which is not in accordance with reality so the reality is that the prophet entered the ihram and made the talbiya after praying two rak'at of prayer and entering the state of ihram and that has been reported by those people who were with the prophet at that time he then pronounced the talbiya when he mounted his she camel to travel to makkah and those people who were there reported that then as the camel proceeded to reach the place of al bayda the prophet again pronounced the talbiya and those who were with him reported that so we find then that the first time the prophet made the talbiya was in the masjid of dhul hulaifa where he first entered the ihram after the two rak'at these two rak'at are not the two rak'at of the ihram by the way there's no particular evidence for a specific two rak'at for the ihram this word al bayda normally refers to a place which is empty it does not have any houses or plantation and things it is just an empty tract of land and here the bayda is an elevated piece of land which comes after dhul hulaifa hadith number 5 to make the ihlal meaning the raising of the voice with the talbiya from where your riding animal leaves ubayd ibn jurayh asked abdullah ibn umar oh abu abdurrahman that was his kunya i have seen you do four things which no one else does so ibn umar asked him so what are they and ibn jurayh replied i saw you only touch the two yemeni corners of the kaaba which is the black stone corner and the yemeni corner and then secondly i saw you wear the na'al as sabtiya the sabtiya type of shoes which is the sandals of tanned leather which does not have hair on them and then thirdly i saw you put on yellow dye and then fourthly when you were in makkah the people raised their voices when they saw the hilal but you did not raise your voice with the talbiya 
until it was the Yawm at the day of giving water, meaning to say the 8th of the Hijjah. So Ibn Umar replied, As for the corners of the Kaaba, then I only saw the Prophet touching those corners. As for wearing the Asibtiya shoes, the tanned leather without any hair, then I saw the Prophet wearing these types of shoes, and he wore these shoes with wet feet after performing the wudu, and so I like to wear them. As far as the yellow dye is concerned, I saw the messenger dyeing the beard or the clothing with this colour. And as for making the talbiyah on the 8th, then I did not see the Prophet make the talbiyah until his riding animal set off. This is a valuable hadith. We can take from it that if you see a knowledgeable person doing something which you feel may not be right, then ask him about it. Because he may have knowledge which has not reached you. Or he may genuinely be mistaken. So ask about it. We also find that Ibn Umar was open to discussion and being questioned, and that's a good quality. We take from this hadith how strict Ibn Umar was. In following the sunnah of the Prophet, he knew much about the sunnah which most people did not, hence testifying to his great level of knowledge and high status. So what are these four specific things which Ibn Umar did? Well, first of all, touching the two Yemeni corners of the Kaaba, but not the other two. The reason for this is because those two corners are built on the original foundations of Ibrahim salam. The other two corners are not because the Quraysh did not rebuild the Kaaba on the original foundations of Ibrahim. So the Prophet only touched those two corners. The black stone can also be kissed. The Yemeni corner is not kissed. It is touched. And with the black stone corner, if you cannot touch it, then you would make the takbir and indicate to it. The Yemeni corner, you would not do that. If you cannot touch it, you simply don't do anything. You don't indicate to it and make the takbir. So those are differences between the two corners. But the similarity is that both can be touched, but the other two are not touched. The second issue about wearing these sibtiya sandals, which are of tanned leather with no hair on them. The Prophet did it, so Ibn Umar is going to do it, even though it is not one of those sunnah which is reward-worthy to be followed, meaning to say an ibadah type of sunnah. This sunnah is just from the adah, from the habitual practices of the people. But Ibn Umar was so eager to follow the sunnah right down to the very letter. And so if someone does that, intending to imitate the Prophet and be close to the Prophet, then that is reward-worthy. Otherwise, it is not the ibadah type of sunnah or the sunnah which is legislated in the deen. Rather, this is a sunnah which is of the customs of the people, and the Prophet is simply following what is normal in the customs. It has been said that these sibtiya shoes are luxury type of shoes, and we know the Prophet would not normally indulge in luxury. So if it is true that these are the luxury type of shoes, then we can say that there's no problem in wearing some good quality clothing now and then. And if Allah Jalla wa'ala grants you this good quality clothing or food, then he likes to see you take this ni'mah from him. Then we have the third issue about dyeing with the yellow colour. What exactly was dyed here? Well, some say the hair was dyed and others say the clothing was dyed. And Nawawi says that it is more likely to be the cloth being dyed with this perfume because the Prophet would not dye his hair. However, we know that the Prophet would put perfume on his beard or his hair and that perfume would have a dye. So it would colour the hair. So both are possible, dyeing the clothing or dyeing the hair whether it be the hair of the beard or the head. But of course, the perfume is put on before entering the ihram, not afterwards. And then the fourth issue is about the ihlal, which is talbiyah, when to do it. Now, most people, according to this narration, were doing it when they saw the hilal of Dhul Hijjah. That would be the first of Dhul Hijjah. But Ibn Umar did it far later, on the 8th. And he says that he saw the Prophet do it when he rode his animal to go to Mecca. This would be from Dhul Hulayfa. So in other words, it is not from the beginning of the hijjah it is when you enter the state of ihram remember we spoke about the three narrations with regards to when the prophet began the ihlal so if you are in mecca and you want to start the hajj which is on the 8th then you would begin the ihlal which is the talbiyah on the 8th you would not do it on the 7th or before that you can do but that is not the sunnah so what ibn umar is doing here is making the qiyas he's saying that the prophet made the Talbiyah, when he entered the Ihram, so I'm also going to do the same thing when I enter the Ihram, which for me, Ibn Umar is saying, is on the 8th. So with this narration, we find four aspects which Ibn Umar had knowledge of and most other people did not. Touching the two Yemeni corners, 
wearing the Siptiya sandals, dyeing the hair yellow, that would be with Zafran or Wars, and making the Talbiya when you enter the Ihram, not before. Hadith number 6, about the prayer in the Masjid of the Hulayfa from Abdullah ibn Umar. He says the Prophet spent the night at the Hulayfa and he prayed in its Masjid. Now, this action of staying in the Masjid of Dhul Hulayfa and praying therein is not from the rites of the Hajj. It's just the Prophet happened to do it. And anyone who does that wanting to follow the Prophet, then this is good. Otherwise, there's no particular virtue in and of itself for this action. Hadith number 7, putting perfume on for the Muhrim before he enters the Ihram. From Aisha, she says, I used to put perfume on the Prophet for his Ihram meaning to say before he entered the Ihram, and for his Hill, meaning when he would exit the state of Ihram, before he would make the Tawaf of the house, meaning to say before the Tawaf al -Ifaba. So here in this narration, Aisha is telling us that she would put perfume on the Prophet on two occasions, for his Ihram and for his Hill, that is the exiting of the Ihram. So we learn that you can put perfume on, be it your beard or head or clothing, before the Ihram, but not afterwards. As for putting the perfume on for his hill before the Tawaf al ifaba then we know that the Prophet stoned the Jamratul Aqba, he sacrificed the animal, and then he shaved his head, and then he made the Tawaf al ifaba So Aisha says that she put the perfume on him before the Tawaf al ifaba So that would have to be after the pelting and the animal sacrifice and the shaving of the head. So it would then indicate to us that the first exiting of the Ihram, because there are two types of exiting. The first exiting is after you have pelted the jamra and you have shaved the head. So you've done two of these things. The animal sacrifice does not have an effect on you exiting the ihram. The ulama have become flexible here. They said that if you do two of any of these three things, then that's the first exiting of your ihram. The three actions are stoning the jamra al aqba, shaving the head, and making the tawaf al ifada and the sa'i if you have not done so already. These are three actions, they say. Any two of these actions would mean your first exiting of the Ihram. And then when you do the third one, you've fully exited the Ihram. Because these actions do not need to be done in order. They can be done in any order you want. Hadith number 8. The prohibition of hunting during the Ihram. From as sab ibn Jathama al-Layfi. He gave some meat to the Prophet as a gift, but the Prophet rejected it. And when the Prophet saw his reaction, he told him, Inna lam naruddahu alayka illa anna hurum. We only gave it back to you because we are in the state of Ihram. Now this meat was hunted and given to the Prophet. It was hunted for the Prophet. If game animal of the land, who is wild by nature, is hunted for the muhrim, then he's not allowed to eat it. If the game animal is just hunted and some of the meat is thereafter, given to the muhrim, then he is allowed to eat it because here it was not hunted for the muhrim and neither did the muhrim help the hunter in any way. So anyway, the point is that hunting the land game animals who are wild by nature is not allowed for the muhrim. It is one of those things which are prohibited in the ihram, whereas otherwise it is halal. We find that the Prophet returned the gift. Now normally the sunnah is to accept the gift, but this is a real exception here because in this case, if the Prophet accepted this gift, he would be accepting a haram type of gift. And of course, you don't accept the haram type of gift. Also, notice the good nature of the Prophet. When he saw As-Sa'ab ibn Jathama in a sad state, he gave him solace and he gave him a reason as to why the gift was rejected. However, in the same chapter, we have another narration from Abu Qatada. He says, we left and headed for Mecca with the Prophet. And some of the companions, including Abu Qatada, took the seaside route to observe if there were any enemies. That is what the Prophet ordered them to do. And so all of them made the ihram except Abu Qatada. He did not make the ihram yet. He saw a zebra and he pounced on it and sacrificed it. And they ate from its meat. Zebra, of course, being one of the game animals. But then they questioned themselves, we are eating this meat whilst we are in a state of ihram. Is this permissible? So they met up with the Prophet and they told him about what happened. And the Prophet asked him, هَلْ مِنْكُمْ أَحَدٌ أَمْرَهُ أَوْ أَشَارَ إِلَيْهِ بِشَيْءٍ Did any one of you order Abu Qatada to do that or pointed out the zebra to him? They said no. 
Then the Prophet said, فَكُلُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنْ لَحْمِهَا Then eat whatever remains from its meat. So in this hadith, they are allowed to eat the meat of the game animal because it was not sacrificed for them and neither did they help Abu Qatada in killing this game animal. Hadith number 9 about what type of animals can be killed. From Aisha, the Prophet said, خَمْسٌ مِنَ الدَّوَابِ كُلُّهَا فَاسِقٌ تُقْتَلُوا فِي الْحَرَمِ الْغُرَابُ وَالْحِدْعَةُ وَالْكَلْبُ الْعَقُورُ وَالْأَقْرَبُ وَالْفَأْرَةُ Five type of animals, all of them are fasiq, they can be killed in the haram. These are the crow, the kite, the biting dog, the scorpion, and the mouse or the rat. So these animals are called fasiq because unlike other types of animals, they cause much harm. So these types of animals and those animals similar to it can be killed in the hill or the haram. All five of these animals mentioned here are not game animals. The kite and the crow are two types of birds. The kite would eat the meat which is for the people, the crow would harm the camels. The mouse and the rat are well known for their mischievous behaviour. The biting dog also is a dangerous animal. The aqrab, which is a scorpion, again, it has a poisonous sting, it is dangerous and can be killed. Any animal which is more dangerous than them, then it is even more worthy to be killed. Hadith number 10, the permissibility to shave the head off for the muhrim if it is harming him, but that you must give the fidya. From Ka'b ibn Ujra, he says that the ayah, 196 in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَفِدْيَةٌ مِنْ صِيَامٍ أو صَدَقَةٍ أو نُسُكٍ Then a ransom of fasting or charity or animal sacrifice for the one who shaves his head. He says, this was revealed for me. He says, I had some harm on my head. I was carried to the Prophet and lice were falling off my head, onto my face. And the Prophet said, مَا كُنْتُ أَرَى أَنَّ الْجَهْدَ بَلَغَ مِنْكَ مَا أَرَى I did not know that the pain has reached you to this level. Do you find a sheep to sacrifice? He said no. And then the ayah was sent down. Then a ransom from fasting or charity or animal sacrifice. And so the Prophet told him to fast three days or to feed six poor people half a sar each. Shaving the head off is not permissible because it is one of the rites of the Hajj. So you cannot do it before it's due time. If you do it because of lice or some injury, then certainly this is permissible, but you would have to offer the fidya, as mentioned in the hadith. And here you have a choice of one of these three things. If you shave off a little bit of hair, for example, to make hijama on the head, then there is no fidya. Some scholars said that we will make analogy and say that you're not allowed to clip your nails or shave off any other type of hair. They are making this analogy with the illa, with the justification that you're not allowed to do anything which is of tarafu or goodly or luxury living. But this illa seems to be quite weak because you are allowed to eat and drink some luxury items. However, we could still go along with the majority opinion here, just to be on the safe side. Otherwise, when it comes to evidence, then we don't really seem to have any. The only evidence for the fidya is when it comes to shaving the head off. What type of animal is sacrificed? The same type of animal you would sacrifice for the udhiya. And where would you sacrifice this animal if you were to shave the head? It would be the same place where you actually shaved off your head. So there is no particular designated place. So as we know, what is normally worn in the ihram is the rida and the izar. And that is what the Prophet wore. And these types of clothing are lowly and humble clothing and thus they facilitate the remembrance of Allah Jalla wa ala. because normally luxury hinders you from the remembrance of Allah also if he cannot find the na'lain and he wears the khufain does he have to offer a fidya? the answer is no because if that were the case the Prophet ought to have mentioned it because at that hadith was the precise moment that it should have been mentioned let it also be noted that these restrictions and this hadith of the clothing is applicable only to men and not to women. Women can wear the normal dress which they wear, be it the abaya or the jilbab, the khimar, and all the usual dress. They may wear the khufain or other than that. As long as they conceal the aura, then this is the main thing. In another narration, we find that the one who does not find an izar may wear the sarawil, which are the thin trousers. And again, we say the same thing, there is no fidya upon you, because there is no evidence for any fidya. Also, regarding the muaqit, 
It is not permissible to enter the state of Ihram before the Miqat. Rather, it has to be at the Miqat. Otherwise, it would just be easier to enter the Ihram from your own house and start saying the Talbiyah. But this is not what the Prophet instructed. Also note that these Mawaqeet were at that time for people who were not Muslimin. So it's as if the Prophet is predicting that those people are going to embrace Islam and they're going to come from those places to perform the Hajj. Note also when we talk about the Ihram, we are not talking about the clothing. Ihram means when you make the intention to enter and start performing the rituals of the Hajj. And so in this state, you make haram on yourself what ordinarily would be halal. Similarly, in the state of fasting and the state of salah, these are also states of ihram. You make haram on yourself what is ordinarily halal. However, in the hajj or the umrah, when you first enter the state of ihram, you state out what you intend to perform. And this is specific for the hajj and the umrah. You do not do this for the salah or the siyam. So if you're making umrah, you would say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً And then you make the talbiyah. Or for the hajj, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ حَجًّا And then you make the talbiyah. As this is what Jibreel alayhi salam ordered the Prophet to do. What is the ruling on saying the talbiyah? The strongest opinion is that it must be said at least once and that is wajib. Because Jibreel came and told the Prophet, to order his companions to raise their voices with the talbiyah. And an order implies obligation. Many scholars would say it is sunnah. Other scholars even say it is a rukun of the hajj. In any case, it must be said once. And that usually happens when you enter the ihram anyway. So most people should be okay with this rule. And you do not expect anyone to fall short here. Also with regards to the Prophet staying the night at Dhul Hulayfa in the masjid, then you might argue that this was a coincidence, meaning it just happened to happen. You could also argue that the Prophet intended it as an act of ibadah. So the matter is debatable, and both opinions are understandable. As for praying in the masjid, then this is the two rak'at of the fard of the asr salah, because he shortened the salah to two rak'at. In the Sahihain, this is what Anas reports, that he prayed dhuhr in al Madina four rak'at, and Asr at Dhul Hulayfa, two rak'at. In the story of Abu Qatada hunting the zebra, we have a question. Why did Abu Qatada not enter the ihram and the others did? Did Abu Qatada pass the miqat without entering the ihram? Because that, of course, would be a problem. And the best answer that can be given is that the story of Abu Qatada happened in the year of Hudaybiyah, that is the sixth year. And the mawaqit were legislated in the year of the Hajjat al the 10th year. Okay, here's a question. Are you allowed to kill other types of animals other than the five mentioned in the Hadith? The answer is yes. The only animals you're not allowed to kill are the ones mentioned in the text, such as, for example, the Hudhud, and other than it, likewise, the game animals are not allowed to be killed in the state of Ihram. But if other types of insects or animals were killed, then it would not be Haram. Having said that, it is not fit and right for a person to go around killing insects and other animals without a genuine need. As for the fidya, then of course you have three choices. Sacrifice a sheep, or fast three days, or feed six poor people half a sa each. According to the narration of Ka'ab ibn Ujra, the sacrifice could be done anywhere. And other scholars say that any time you have to sacrifice an animal, then it should be in the haram and for the people of the Haram. But the point is that the Prophet did not specifically mention that it had to be in the Haram. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. Can a child or an insane person or a servant discharge their duty of the obligatory Hajj? Explain your answer with evidence. Question number two. What type of clothing cannot be worn in the Ihram? Question number three. If a person wants to perform the Umrah or the Hajj, and he is not directly passing by any one of the designated Mawaqeet, then what is his course of action?